This is Animation Nights New York, Animator Interviews. Thank you so much to Animation for Adults for letting us be a part of their channel. And next up is an interview with Giovanni Munari. Giovanni is an animator, he's also a graphic designer and illustrator, and we screened his short film Arithmetic at our May movies screening last year. We sat down at 180 Maiden Lane. Please enjoy. Welcome Giovanni Munari. Uh, to 180 Maiden Lane, where we are uh, again doing another interview. Um, thank you very much for participating. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for hosting me. So you can hear sort of the ambient uh, noise again, which at this point may be a little bit recognizable. <laughs> um, but here we are at 180 cool Maiden Lane. Yeah. How do you <laughs> have you been here at this space uh, before? No, it's actually my first time. I only see it on pictures, so it's incredible like to be here. It's it? it's a very cool space, and I, both the architecture and the like plants and the lighting is astonishing. Yeah, it's good to see that that you have a great location because it means that the community is growing also, yeah. right? That the selection is great, and um, I I mean I. I mean, this is New York, so everything is happening. <laughs> but I remember when I, when I was a, a student in animation, what I was missing the most was like, I, I had this great opportunity with my school in Italy to go to Unsee. And it was a huge, fe it's a huge festival, so it, we were so excited about it. But what was great about the school is that we were so close together, living together in the same space all the time. So it, it, it's, it was kind of a, a whole festival a year long and when I when I attended any and I saw so many student grad students here I realized what was it about like of course there is a need of community and a need of sharing and curating because a lot is happening online and a lot of, of people are creating but it's it's very hard to to this to to navigate that. Yeah, it's true, it's true. We take uh, a lot of time and care making sure all the films have a place to sort of do their thing, you know, yeah, and yeah, really yeah. shine. Just the other day I was putting together a couple of the programs and thinking like, these guys, guys and gals, <laughs> the <laughs> films that are sitting in the folder. <laughs> <laughs> filmmakers I'm like okay these need to be part of a program but I don't like it's not their time yet it just started yeah. to feel that way you oh, know yeah. what I mean um, but then every now and then you put a program together and you're just like oh this, this is beautiful like everything kind of flows the way it's supposed to you know you live and work in Rome is that right I was or? I was living in Rome uh, um, some time ago and I was uh, working for Cartoon Network doing the commercials and online mm -hmm. and, uh, and on air also yeah. sometimes and then I am I'm now currently living in modern switching from here and there <laughs> which is amazing and a lot stressful but exciting <laughs> and I have this big opportunity and this is also why I, I thought you know there is a huge community in Italy of animators that really work hard but I, as every animator I think they kind of are focused on their work and so they, they just you know it's nice to get connections and yes. And explore, uh, especially like guests for students in their grad years. And the, the animation graduation film is gonna take them like their life, probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so it's great to have a space for them. That after I came here, I discovered Annie, and this is how I got in touch with yeah. you. And Arithmetic is quite. <clears throat> old I'd say it's 2009 <laughs> already which seems so long ago and it is uh, and it's made by me and my friend Dalila who is also an animator and you should definitely check out her yes. work we, we really wanted to make uh, something that started from the sound because we felt like it was uh, it was more interesting and a way easier for us because we just didn't know how great storyteller we were. We had backgrounds in graphic design, illustration, and animation, but we never, we were kind of a, I was simply also a bit scared of directing. So I was like, okay, I need a, I need a bone. Uh, and, and, and we used the music for that. And we were lucky enough to find 
a recording of Ravel that was already out of credit, out of uh, right. So the school was able to, you know, take it and use it, and we the school was producing us. So uh, we we just decided to start from the music, and the music was great, and the story was perfect because the this kid that was running into objects that get animated so everybody in theater when this because it, it used to be an opera and, and it was a, a libretto yeah uh, like Colette yeah I looked, Colette. yeah I it's checked amazing, it out. it's amazing work and everybody was really uh, astonished by the number of characters in the theater and it was really a huge production for a very very small time uh, opera so uh, even I remember looking and researching and I found out that uh, even Ravel when he saw Snow White he thought well this could be the way and yeah. and we were and we were so excited about it because it meant that it, it had to be done yeah. and also Lot Reininger the puppet animation from yes. the 30s she apparently she tried to do it there are traces of that she was interested in that opera and I still I still find it terribly interesting and I I, I mean I, I wonder why anybody has done the whole feature film out of it but yet we so we started doing the 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 short film taking just one track right. there was the track of the math teacher right because in the original story I, I did just a little bit of research mm -hmm. on it uh, a child is reprimanded by objects in yes. his room and the objects sort yeah. of come to life and it says a rude child but going through your film so he sort of walks in and is um, scolded and is in a huff right yeah, <laughs> and then a... and then but the focus is on specifically the portion where the um, uh, someone sort of comes out of the book what's interesting to me is um, so the child sits down and uh, and is you know it's like okay fine resigns myself to doing his homework it seems and then uh, I was paying attention to the clock a lot for some like looking for little messages and so I don't know yeah. but like so so like the the it shows the clock and then he sort of nods off and it chimes for o'clock and uh, and what was interesting to me though is then when he spills the ink and then this sort of wizard comes out of this black ink spill. Then it becomes this um, almost arithmetic lesson, sort of saying, well, "This is why," or at least because I don't know what the lyrics mean. I'm just, yeah, this is just know, what I take, and yeah. yes, that's what I, I uh, wanted to ask. But in the end, there's no lesson because no, he's just no. like gets the hell scared it's, out of him, shuts the book, and that's it. Yeah, it's a nightmare of homeworks. <laughs> <Yes, exactly. laughs> it's just the nightmare of homeworks, and I found like as a schoolboy, I found pretty fascinating, but yet. I wasn't good at math, so uh -huh. I found it perfect for myself. But also, like I think many, many people find, find mathematics with their kids like a little bit. They tried to torture us with it. I don't <laughs> yeah. think it was taught properly. This is my thinking. I feel like if it was done in a more of a visual way, I think that students now have a, an advantage in so many things because of the sort of visual elements that are available online. Well, this is like a super old story, and it's interesting <laughs> to see how yet in the 1920s, is people were concerned about trying to educate kids and yet <laughs> the math was like something very obnoxious and an old teacher even in the in the original story that's kind of obsessed and math became an obsession and you can tell that Ravel itself was quite of a, an obsessive person and quite a mathematic person because the Volero itself is is like built on mathematical skins that grows and grows and grows and and that's kind of a similar structure like it's a reaches to a climax and in which you wake up and it's like a nightmare in which you, you just you know grows and grows and you want to just go out and actually ending the movie was kind of a hard so we and en we ended up like with this idea of him closing just closing <laughs> the book because we had no idea how to escape like uh, 
ourself. And, uh, and there's no escape for him because those hands that are chasing no. him into back into reality in the study, yeah, they, we, we, they appear in the study. <laughs> yeah, the great thing about animation is that you can make anything really scary. Yeah. Like, <laughs> So I, we used all the cliches that were in horror movies yeah. like hands and shadows. And we really wanted it to create two different words. And also it was for artistical needs because we had two different hands and as as drawers and we really want to our drawings to communicate to each other so I, we decided okay let's do like the real world and i take care of like the backgrounds in the real world and you yeah. are more on the characters and i and i was more of a graphic designer and i'm still doing graphic design so i used the skills of graphic design to create you know something that was more of an abstraction and in the beginning what he was saying is it's like a, a math um, problem which has you know eggs and dreams and yeah. it's all in French and it's pretty quick so nobody I think understand what he's saying but it, we didn't really care about it yeah. but we the idea was to put all the objects that were in the in the in the problems together dancing like so the lyrics for that that segment were written by Colette and and what kind like they're just sort of paraphrasing what are they what do oh, they cover yeah. okay so it says something like I should have studied it's been four years no I'm sorry I'm joking but <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, it says like uh, basically playing with the with the traces of uh, early 1920 uh, problems for kids so you know there are two trains that goes in this direction and they goes one goes faster than another which ones are right first how many eggs can you carry when you have you're going to the market and and so the <clears throat> the French song is really funny and I, I don't want to sing it now <laughs> so, no but it's it's like uh, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a it's a mix of a lesson. So on the on the book, it's like a notebook, uh -huh. and he's writing the the poems. So it's like tout uh, robinet cool le danseur et voir et voilà, which means like do two things are pouring water into a, a uh, tank, and it's like the initial part of a problem. And I don't know, maybe kids nowadays are not used to this kind of imaginary stuff, imagery. Uh -huh. And, but I remember it. as a kid, I, I wasn't born in the 1920s, of course, but as a kid, I, I remember, you know, having all these kind of a problems dealing with the market, the eggs and yeah. stuff like that. And we just put, we just put the objects in it and they, they literally pull out of, of this notes book and they animate with the, with the, with the ink because actually what is, it's, it's kind of a, the demon is kind of a, getting out of the ink so there is trains there is eggs there is scissors and there is water and the water itself kind of a get into a huge uh, ocean yeah. and then it's like it's literally like we took the words by Colette that were used mostly as poems because they were needed to be sung by the singer in the theater so the the text itself doesn't really say much but it's good also because in dreams we don't have like rational logical consequences of things so we really want to create a nightmare and we didn't care really about what was real what was happening and yeah. and no, and great. except the clock that it's just represent the boredom of, right. of everything yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah that was it that was it but it's 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 an incredibly interesting the whole the whole project Ravel did with Colette because uh, there are lots of more more character in the story and it would be awesome you know to make yeah to make them all but uh, yeah so after that we were trying to we are still trying to make another short film based on on the same idea and it's um, it's made out of, of another scary story which is Blue Bear <laughs> And it's uh, at the beginning we wanted to use the music as well. That's uh, another. So these two, these two, let's say mus musical history masterpieces goes together, which is Ravel L'Enfant et le Sortilège and Blue Bear, uh, the, <coughs> the 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 
the castle of Bluebird but from Bella Bartok and they are kind of uh, used in for kids to mm, teach classical music actually I, I seen on my YouTube upload that there are a lot of comments and most of them are like from French kids saying oh we're doing this at school it's so boring <laughs> <laughs> and I never understand if it's boring like Ravel or maybe my movie but whatever I just like that there are comments on it and <laughs> we will take care of that um, you know what I like is the repeating themes um, of line and like the fireplace and and the water and the sort of it's almost like his beard like it seems a part of him like a magical wave it, it's, it could be paper lines or it could be you know yeah that's that's the the genius of Dalila who was drawing with me and she has this incredible style that goes with super thin lines and dark circles and even in her writing is quite interesting to me but so we kind of combined together and she she was designing mostly the kids and the face of the of the monster let's say or the teacher <laughs> <laughs> which is not exactly the same thing but um, no actually uh, yeah she she kind of uh, used this uh, style to match together the real world which would be like this the room of the boy and you know the magical world in which there are waves and and this kind of lines are really hard to animate as well so she was really really she's also she's talented talented in designing but mostly like in animation because it's, it's like can I say a pain in the ass <laughs> but anyway it's like really hard to animate thin lines it was drawn uh, partially on paper and partially like paperless on, on directly with the with the Wacom yeah. tablet. And then there's also some puppet animation there as well. There is some puppet animation yeah. because the the monster is, is yeah. puppet. I love that contrast. It was really cool. Yeah, I, I loved puppet animation, and I I was interested in Log Reininger as well. Yes. And I I I was very very mm, uh, attracted, I'd say, you know, by um, Ocelot work and. I wanted to do that and so I tried to combine the two styles and I'm very interested in opera and theater music and how animation could deal into that. So I thought I found out that puppet animation was both like a link to this and also I'd say I'm not like a super I like to draw but I, I'm in, I was studying traditional drawing animation and um, for me it was more interesting to move I to move like a drawn character that had you know this kind of shapes right. and the puppet animation was done in after effects mm -hmm. so it's it's not like a photograph or at the beginning we thought it was cooler but we didn't have time enough so yeah. we did it in after effect which was great because at the end of the movie i was quite confident with the program and it was yeah. really <laughs> helpful <laughs> um, there is drawn animation digital animation and and puppet animation yeah that's it that's mostly it so um what are you working on in these other arenas like for illustration and uh and graphic design and do you want to talk about the current projects uh in a little more detail um, about what you're working on now this next film the current project yeah, we are still working on bluebird uh, as um, animators and Dalila is working on her uh, also a personal project of hers. Um, she she has also been working for uh, Gumball uh, as a set designer and you know, prop, props designer. Um, what I'm mostly doing now is uh, I, I did illustration for Italian uh, publishers. Um, and I'm, I'm doing graphic design mostly. I, I kind of keep animation for my personal projects and yeah. yeah, so Blueberry is gonna be the next one, but it's taking very long, so I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of a strange to talk about it right now, but I feel like there is still a, a, a style for that divides a bit Europe from USA, and yeah. and it's kind of interesting, and I I think that bridging this it would be really even more especially because yeah. the way school are are built 
in in Italy or in Europe, I don't know about Europe in general, but the way we were taught animation, it was like a full time process, as as I mentioned you, we were like living there so surrounded only by animators and that sounds beautiful <laughs> it's, it's it sounds scary we all get we are still friends so much and we are all get, got crazy about it we can't really explain anyone else in the real world how it works <laughs> but it was amazing like uh, processly wise we you were constantly talking about your project with people that were invested in, in the same passion and, and this is why i think festival are are there are there for um, for professionals as well and for students you know to just sneak out of their room it's kind of a interesting because there is a need of you know somehow getting together that's this kind of screening does yeah I, I, I never thought about it properly so it's it's kind of amazing and the idea of like you know because every everybody now can go on Vimeo and look for them but on one hand you don't have like curatorial style or and on the other one it's like so interesting to talk to the makers mm-hmm. i really i really miss that part like you know exchanging ideas or techniques about what you do and how you do it and what's what you want to do and for me i'm kind of a starting from illustration uh, I had my own imaginary and my own idea of what I wanted to do when I made animation but it was so interesting and so enriching for me to confront it with people that were coming to animation from different perspectives and to different aims like video games, titles, uh, like it's, a, it's, it's an incredible medium that can offer so much space to anyone really like and literally anyone who wants to animate can animate and you don't need to draw so right, right. so it's it's kind of a it, it was what was amazing for me in the experience of learning it was also confrontating with other words this is also why I kept theater and opera in my work because I, it was a word that I was really intrigued by and I wanted to know more but you can literally talk about anything in animation and it's this is powerful and it's it's such a shame that that since very not long ago it was a field in Italy only related to kids so you know animators that were there were a lot of people using animation to talk about their issues and their adult lives but they were hidden like they were no not really right and that's the thing what's what's interesting now is I think there's um, I think periodically there's a reshift onto mm-hmm. adult animation mm-hmm. or or animation f- for not necessarily for kids, let's say. Um, and I think that shift has happened again, you know, because you have uh, movies like Anomalisa and and um, you know things like that are a little bit more st- mainstream. And they've always been there. I mean, that's you know, early animation was for adults, not for children, right? Um, yes. And uh, and the, yeah, it's it's really it's been very interesting. The fact that you can tackle any subject, and talk about anything, and we had a show, we had a program last month. It was heavy. <laughs> it was heavy, and um, I mean, you know, it was beautiful. You know. Yeah, there are there are uh, some friends of mine started working on a project that was like actually like uh, on erotism, and and it it was kind of a pushing into porn of course somehow but it was really interesting because there was such there was a need probably you know of taking the medium and get dragging it out of you know all the stuff that's cutie and and nice that we all know and I think a huge part of this is related to the big industry of feature film which I think, uh, yeah, Anomalisa was amazing, but I, I think the main audience is not used to see this kind of technique, yeah. and it's a technique that requires the different uh, timing in, in understanding or in uh, absorbing it. And you, what I was, what I was uh, experiencing while watching it was this incredible sensation of feeling both detached and empathizing with, with the, with the person there 
and I think this is like what uh, stop motion does but the majority of the people go to see Beauty and the Beast which is great yeah. but they, they, they are not trained there is this idea that mm, I don't know where it comes from but when you entertain someone you have two choices like you, you want to just distract him from his everyday life or you want to push his mind somewhere he never went to yeah. and this kind of things they rarely happen together who can do that is like a genius and I, I, I really admire the very few people that can do this together but uh, most of the time they choose to, cho to do one or another and when it comes to that choice it gets to a political choice in my head Interesting. Yeah, that's because true. when you when you believe your audience you want to just entertain someone from your everyday life you are kind of admitting that the system is just <laughs> that one right also you, you make uh, quicker choices and you make easy choices when you think your audience is, is kind of a less uh, you underestimate your audience <clears throat> and it's a, it's a big mistake it's usually a big mistake on one hand on the other one there is probably a problem of distribution or I don't know what but sometimes f feature films like uh, Anomalisa who are extraordinary they didn't reach like I remember some films were harder to find than others and uh, and others were like everywhere in every cinema in front of you in the metro station like it's like so there is literally a, a privilege of certain kind of entertainment against another that's true that's uh, true although i mean and i think that um sort of the growth oh, sort of the growth of what we're doing um proves yeah. that there is an interest for it because we're, even our audience is not they're not all just filmmakers, you know. Some people mm -hmm. are they're professionals mm -hmm. or aficionados or yeah. or just fans or people who, um, you know, are, enjoy critical thinking or seeing another perspective. It's it's interesting because uh, all my a lot of friends of mine are working on very interesting project, but they are kind of a, uh, of course, like uh, always happens. Uh, like the creator is focused on the creation and it doesn't care about you know distribution or, right. or just you know it, it just right. uploads the, the movie online and that's it and of course because it doesn't have a training or it doesn't even care probably it just wanted to make um, but we are in a moment in which people are really really able to make a lot of things and, and some of them are great and they are really hidden uh, and um, I think this leads also to a kind of a flows in what animation does to me sometimes, which is uh, something that my teacher were telling me a lot and I didn't care at the time, but now retrospectively I think they were right. <laughs> so it's mostly the fact that animators are really, since it's like a super meticulous and long and full of effort work, it's super hard work, you kind of... Uh, uh, you kind of lose the track of the story sometimes yeah. and you get you get stuck in the details of representational and you know ex techniques and animation techniques and the fluidity of your animation and, and you lose endless time in making the scene perfect which is amazing to me but when it comes to a short film like the story kind of a loosen up and it's it's a it's a flow that has my film as well retrospectively <laughs> so i it's a self criticism as well that i want to make it's not just you know yeah. i feel like it's very hard to balance when you have a technique that's so detailed and so you know over time right. uh, long to balance with the whole vision and uh, you know the single scene or the single shot or the single frame yeah. actually so it's it's interesting and it's this is also why i think cinema gets best when it's a, when the team is super uh, it's a great group that's working together and uh, uh i i really really enjoy animation because now we can have authors and, and as a as if you have a computer you can do your own stuff 
and you can do it from scratch to the end. And you can collaborate with people from around the world. But you can, uh, yes, but you can also do that, and you can. So it's it's both like uh, it's not just like you know drawing or illustrating something that it it's not really collaborating physically with someone. Uh, there is this opportunity that's very interesting, and it usually. Uh, if I would have to start another project, I would I would really like, which is not based on music. I would really like to collaborate with a screenwriter or a or a person that's really trained in screenwriting for short films because that's really key to me. Give give yourself the opportunity to spend some time over something that you're really passionate about with people that are passionate about. It's just you know makes you, makes you grow uh, exponentially, and I I. I I still feel a lot of emotional connections with my mates yeah. there, and uh, we. One of them actually was was taken at at uh, New York's C- Children Film Festival, mm-hmm. and uh, with the film Nino and Felix, uh-huh. which uh, that you should definitely check out on Vimeo. Yeah. And it's uh, it's again it's uh, like an interesting story of two kids, uh, one from the south of Europe and the other one from the north of Europe. Mm-hmm. They are forced to stay together for family reason, and they they start to fight. And then you'll see what's going on. Oh, <laughs> no, it's it's super nice and it's very very well designed. And actually, it, I it didn't get um, it was really interesting because they were putting a lot of scenes of this short film in the trailer of New York Film Festival, Children Film Festival. So it was a really honor. I mean, it's uh, it's a great thing. And I think the design is it's awesome. Yeah, these people that you meet um, and sort of connect with over, you know, a shared art form or people that you collaborate, that you, you know, you're all on the same page sort of working to put these um, art pieces together, right, with a message. Um, it's almost like when you reconnect with them, it sort of open little opens little windows in your mind or whatever, you know. Yeah. It sort of it helps you, um, you know, come up with other ideas. But not only that, it uh, sort of refocuses you, focuses you on what's important for you artistically. Yes, definitely, definitely. Especially like even in a very quick exchange. But if, if it's real, not yeah. virtual, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, it's so important. So, especially in these times. <laughs> um, so, uh, did you? I always ask this because I'm always curious. Like, um, do you, did you draw as a child, and was your family very supportive of any kind of? Well, my family is not a very artistic, uh, artistic concern, <laughs> I'd say. Um, I used to I used to draw Mickey Mouse and Disney, of course, and copy them from yeah. the from the television uh, as a child. And I uh, I remember, mm, <laughs> yeah, there is a funny story about it. But it's <laughs> I remember being asked of, of drawing even when I was in preschool, but I I didn't do draw exactly what they were asking me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was kind of a well, but. Um, yeah, I, I really, I always like to draw, and I, um, but mostly when I was a teenager, I think I used drawing to escape, and I was always impressed when I, sometimes when I was drawing, I, at the at the time I wasn't conscious about the process. I was just, you know, putting out images from my head, and I was always impressed by how somehow real they were. And, and also the comparison between what I had in my mind and what was on the paper was pretty pretty good. So I was really happy with that. And this is how it grew. And then after, after I, 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 I made scientific studies. <laughs> Even if this is why math, the math teacher <laughs> probably should have seen that movie after that. But then, uh, so I made scientific studies, but then I, I quit them and I, I wanted, I really wanted to use my creativity somehow. And I started <clears throat> this school that was awesome in Italy about graphic design and editorial and publishing illustrator. And it was a great school. And, and there I really connected myself with 
with the creation process and at the end my at the end of, in my in, of, of that um, path the teacher said that I should definitely animate my drawings and something clicked over there and I had a friend of mine who made the same school and where where at the at the Turin school I attended afterwards and we connected and we, she talked about the school to me and I this is how I came into animation and I um, so animation for me was always like like a book like like arithmetic itself like a book of I would love a book in which the illustration in it gets to life yeah. and it's kind of a I think well, another thing that really struck me was seeing um, in Paris uh, a Disney exhibit about all the history of the back background artistic work in Disney first movies and uh, uh, <clears throat> the exhibition was something like uh, there was once Walt Disney and it was all apparently when he started creating his own industry he bought many many books from Europe and all these illustrations from 19th century and early 20th century were used as a reference for the style. So you had this incredible illustration from Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan and Pinocchio and you, you saw the, the exhibition was really about comparing and letting you see what were the reference in Disney mind and oh, most of them came to illustration so yeah. Pinocchio this, is so shocking yeah Pinocchio <laughs> is, it's also like weird because it's that original it's story not. he's such a jerk in the original story yeah but also like <laughs> it's 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 really like for for Italian kids Pinocchio is like the bible oh, yeah. <laughs> but but it, it nobody really reads it anymore but it, it used to be like very a uh, milestone in literature and 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 <clears throat> what's interesting is that Pino Disney's Pinocchio is not set in Tuscany as it should be. It's set like in sort some sort of weird place between Switzerland and I don't know where. <laughs> and I didn't. I never got exactly why they made that choice. But at the end, Pino Disney's Pinocchio gets in the end of everyone, and we will never forget it. So it's it's great and. I, and yeah, they probably cut some scenes in Pinocchio because the original story there is death, there yeah. is there is a lot more. And I, I think like I think I we should get back to that in a moment in which we showed even the kids some cruelty, but not you know. Not Jiminy Cricket doesn't yeah, uh, yeah. live long at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. 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 So. So this is what came into the, that exhibition that I saw in Paris was really eye-opening for me, and I realized that the world were more connected than I thought. Illustration, animation were more connected than I thought. So I started, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have some of like your really early work online or accessible? One of them is online as well as on YouTube. I think and it's a character that's like singing an opera but dress but but like it's like a queer drag queen character so it's like it's supposed to be me but not really me and i'm dressing up in front of the of the mirror and 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 singing an opera area <laughs> so it's like totally horrendous i don't know i mean if people just want to go and waste four minutes of their life they can do that <laughs> But it was it was like uh, actually it, it's something that I would love to to, to get could, to go back to because uh, I especially I mean after my experience here in New York where drug queens are so big such a big deal and and such a huge form of entertaining and I I have met so an enormous number of animators that are really into you know that. Um, I think I really wanna. I would love to explore that part again. I remember, like when I when I first uh, made an arithmetic C to a friend of mine who is like a physician, and he made this um, uh, parallelism, and and he said, you know, watching your film is like watching like a super detail um, orificery um, clock, 
and at the time I was like you're totally crazy <laughs> but then I thought about it and he was trying I understood later what he was trying to say and he was trying to I think he understood the amount of work that was behind and he was trying to make a parallel to another industry in which we normally wear something and we don't know how, how much work there is behind it and like jewelry or whatever and there is a lot of you know artistic applied art uh, which has an, an amount of techniques and effort and people are not really aware about it so I, I when I realized he was trying to do that I really appreciate the comments and also I mean the clock is one of the guests in the, in the movie and it was one of Ravel's obsessions as well so it was perfect but yes, I agree with, with you when you, I mean, people don't really understand or when they do, they kind of, uh, when they realize that it could be 25 drawings at a second, it's like they, they just don't understand, they think it's pointless. So it's kind of a crazy. They either say, "Oh, it's so it's so easy to do it. The, the computer makes it all." Or when you when you explain them, "No, actually, it's a big work." And they say, "Then why are you doing it?" And you're like, "Shit." <laughs> so, but but still, you know, they will they will appreciate it when they it's finished. So this is what the important thing is. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It's incredible. So thank you very much, Giovanni, for being here and uh, and chatting. And uh, this has been really super fun. Thank you very much for <laughs> inviting me. It was fun, for sure. Excellent. <laughs>to support this podcast and Animation Nights New York and help us keep our screening events free, you can make a donation on PayPal. You can also be a patron on Patreon. We offer perks. Or you could buy us a coffee. Every little bit does help. So uh, if you can, please do help us out. If you are in the New York City area uh, around the second Wednesday of every month, Swing on by 180 Maiden Lane in the Seaport District of New York City and come check out animated short films with us. We show animated short films and virtual reality animation experiences from all around the world. Admission is free and uh, also film submission is free. So keep supporting independent animation and thank you so much for listening. There's one bird that lives in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> I know, it's pretty nice, uh, mm -hmm. nice digs. <laughs>